So, yep. Welcome everyone to uh, the third lecture as part of the lecture series this fall, uh, which is entitled First Person Narratives for an Accessible Built Environment. Uh, I'm here with Milena, uh, Milena Kazanavicius. Kazanavicius, pretty good. There we go. She told me I didn't have to say it, but I wanted to try. <laughs> so, um, for those of you who maybe haven't joined us before for this lecture series, uh, it's put on by Peach Research Unit at Dalhousie University School of Planning. And I'm Kate Clark, project coordinator at Peach Research. And uh, Makiko Terashima is here with us today. She is the lead researcher at Peach. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to keep my intro a little shorter today because we have a lot, of, a lot to go through, which I think is great, lots of content. So uh, first, just uh, to acknowledge that Dalhousie University uh, is located on Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all truly people. And just like last week, if you were here for Andrew's talk, we're using Zoom meeting instead of Zoom webinar. Uh, so that just means I would like to ask everyone to keep their microphones off. Um, if you'd rather keep your video on, that's, that's okay with me. Uh, or you can turn it off for your own privacy. But microphones muted uh, is our preference as we would like to minimize any kind of interruptions and respect Milena's uh, presentation. Um, a question and answer period will follow at the end of Milena's presentation. So uh, if you can just keep all your questions till then and then we will invite some of you to uh, speak your questions to Milena directly or through me if you prefer through the chat. Uh, when you are posting to the chat, please make sure to send it to everyone. I believe the invite there on the right, it should say to everyone. So just make sure that option is selected. And finally, this recording or this lecture is being recorded so that we can make it available online uh, at a later date for those who couldn't join us today. So without further ado, oh, I'm going to let Milena introduce herself. I uh, thought I had a different slide there. There you go, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, this is uh, Milena and uh, this is a very strange uh, platform for me to be working from. Uh, my one tiny small challenge is presenting to people live so I can uh, gauge my audience and figure out whether you're getting what I'm saying or not. Um, so not being able to see you because I'm completely blind, completely blind, let's not forget that. Um, and not be being able to hear you is a little strange for me. So if my face is going all over the place, it's um, <laughs> because I feel like I'm talking to myself, which is generally what I do anyway. It's just in that strange platform. So I'm going to divert this for one little second. And if we can have a picture up, Kate. Do we have there it is. It is up. Okay. So <clears throat> the presentation is about sharing streets, but this is a picture of a utility pole with five nails sticking out. And you may be asking yourself, why did I put this up? And the reason is, if you can see my forehead, Early Saturday morning, my dog, my guide dog, Lewis, walked around the corner too quickly and I had slipped and smacked into this utility pole with the five nails that are sticking out. I'm going to ask you to become part of my Milena's Mafia, um, that I have my Mafia who are out there taking pictures and send to 311 and walk around with little tools. For people who are putting up posters on utility poles and trees, please, please remove the nails and the staples because I'm not the only one who is now walking around with two holes in my head. I'm, I've, I've recovered, but many other people who are blind and partially sighted had this happen to them as well. Let alone, I've witnessed children running around um, and slipping and falling. It's a danger to all. So put your tools in your purses and backpacks and uh, get them removed. You will be my mafia. Uh, I can't pay you, but I will be very grateful. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself here. Um, mm -hmm. Don't adjust anything on your screen. You have no control whatsoever for the for the time being. Okay. Um, do we have a picture? Yeah, I'm okay. Here. You will be witnessing me through what someone who is blind or partially sighted would be witnessing you through. Uh, what we have going on is um, pictures of cataracts, glaucoma, diabetes, um, macular degeneration, and the last thing that you will be looking through at me through the screen, which you cannot control, because Kate's in control. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, will be what somebody who's completely blind. Again, that would be me. So I've been blind since uh, 1995. I'm uh, 48. 
if I make it to January the 4th, which is Lewis Braille Day, I will be 49. Um, Lewis Braille at the age of 15 invented Braille. That's for your Jeopardy question, now that you've got that going. Okay, um, so I'm an advocate, not what I really want to be doing. I'd rather be enjoying doing crafts and working on other things, but I'm advocating not only for the blind and partially sighted, for accessible access everywhere, most importantly on our streets, um, and for all pedestrians involved, that being uh, parents with strollers, elderly with walkers, anyone with a walker, anybody with a mobility aid, and even for those people who uh, are coming home with groceries in, in their hands and have to divert in other directions because streets are barricaded and or unsafe. That's it on okay. my part. We're gonna get into a questionnaire. Hopefully majority of you got that link and, uh, and filled it out. Kate, my lovely assistant, and thank you <laughs> so much, is going to read the question and then just give the talk answer. Yes, so I'm pulling up the survey now. Thank you to everyone who participated. Um, so the first question was, most individuals who go to CNIB for services have some sight? And you want to know the answer right away? Yes. Okay. 86% said this is true. Very good. You guys are all brilliant and smart back there behind that internet screen. So um, about nine out of 10 people have do, do have some form of vision, whether it's like perception or maybe they'll see during the day um, and not be able to see uh, at night. So they would use a long white cane um, or maybe they're just looking out of the peripheral of their eye. And something that is really important to remember is that if you're talking to someone who's blind or partially sighted and they've turned their head this way, or that way, and I'm pointing up or down for those those who are logged in and can't see. Um, it's they're not doing strange things with their heads. It might make you feel uncomfortable. It's they're putting your pretty faces into the remainder of their vision. So keep that in mind that people are looking at you with the remainder of what they have to see. One little reference here for your next Jeopardy question is that 40, about 40,000 people in Nova Scotia are blind and are partially sighted. 10% of those are completely blind. So keep that number in mind. Question number two. Question number two. The number one cause of sight loss in North America is, and there, this one's a little more divided, but macular degeneration, uh, it's just a little further ahead with 29%. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> what a bunch of smarties back there. Very good. The number one um, cause of sight loss right now in North America is macular degeneration, that is predominantly uh, age-related uh, and for people over the age of 60. So I'm going to tell everyone to make sure that you're keeping your eye health. And um, while, I'm, while I'm going through these, Kate's going to put up uh, four pictures that are uh, the same picture of two little boys with an orange ball. Um, and again, you, you'd be witnessing these, these uh, little boys through the different lens of what people may or may not see. So macular degeneration, the loss of the center of, uh, of your, your eye um, vision. So people would be looking from their peripherals, okay? Turning their heads, um, more than likely able to walk down the sidewalk. Diabetic retinopathy, which is what I lost my eyesight to um, due to poor control, my own fault, um, is the leading cause for people under the age of 50. Uh, it can lead to complete blindness. Um, so if you're diabetic, make sure that you're looking after yourself, eat your cake, but take your insulin and exercise as well. Accidents is predominantly um, with kids or people not wearing their safety goggles. Wear your safety goggles when you're mowing the lawn and you're cleaning the bathroom and whatever you're doing, wear safety goggles, protect your eyes, okay? Cataracts is the leading cause in developing uh, countries because of the lack of medical uh, systems that we have here. In North America, um, right now you can go in to, to get your cataract removed, which is the hardening of the lens and you're seeing through a sort of a foggy lens, they'll remove it with the laser and put in an actual new lens for you. So your vision is pretty much restored. And I think I had glaucoma left, which is the pressure in your eye, which just goes up. All of these, these are just a few eye conditions, but every single one of these can, for the most part, be prevented. Check with your eye physician, a minimum of every two years. I want you going in once a year because I don't want to see you sitting here beside Kate because she's a really good person. Okay. <laughs> Question number three. When talking to a person with sight loss, you should avoid words like blind, see, look, etc. And 62% say false. Very good. What a smart group back there. 
Right. Use the everyday language. Um, whatever you're whatever you're talking, did you see anybody watch the election last night? I stayed up till four o'clock. So I'm a little uh, feeling like I'm in the twilight zone right now. Um, so everyday English language vocabulary, perfectly fine to use with people who are blind and or partially sighted. That being said, over here, over there, that way means absolutely nothing to those of us who cannot see you 100%. So to the left, to the right, in front of you, um, 20 feet ahead or 50 feet back, whatever the case may be, Use your vocabulary for directions. Really important when speaking to someone who's blind or partially sighted. Mm -hmm. People with sight loss automatically have better hearing. 81% say false. What? <laughs> okay, very good. Um, we don't have anything automatically better. Um, my hearing is still very selective. I choose not to hear my partner, sometimes even my father if he's online. <laughs> um, so we learn most of us will learn to use our hearing better because our eyesight is no longer there or it's been diminished. So we learn to use our hearing better. If we go into to an audiologist to get our hearing test, it's no better than what the rest of you are behind the screen are hearing. So we learn to, to use it. It doesn't get any better. Okay, next one. All people with sight loss read and write braille. 100% said false. Very good. Wow, genius is back there. Um, that number is probably about two out of, or three out of 10 people who read Braille to its full literacy. Full pause. Braille is still very, very important for those of us who cannot see. I cannot read Braille because I have damage in my nerves and my fingertips from my diabetic years. So something to think about on the interior when designing. Take a note when you're going to a medical building right now or take a note when you're in the hospital. There's not a single tactile or braille by any door for anybody who's going into a medical building or the hospital to visit their loved ones. Perhaps they're in there themselves, so they don't know what room it is. Yes, there are, there are braille on the elevators perhaps, um, but there's nothing in nowhere. So when I'm in my doctor's medical office, four floors on Gladstone and I'm walking down the hall, it, I have no idea where that door is and I'm kind of guessing. Okay, so we need to start to think forward to put not only Braille, because not everybody reads Braille, but tactile numbers. The numbers for a door are never going to change. The doctors, physicians might, but the number of the door will not. So we need to start to think about that because in the buildings as it stands right now, and I have a friend who's working at a hospital, there's no way for this individual to find where the office is. Okay, okay. Uh, only people with no sight use white cane, and 95% say false. Very good. Okay, so if you're completely blind, you would be using, and I hope I don't hit Kate in the head here. Oh, let me stop the share so that everyone can see you fully. Okay, Yeah. so this is, a, this is a long white mobility cane. Probably everybody has noticed this before. Lots of barbers go into training how to use it. And these are canes that are, can be used by somebody such as myself who doesn't see anything at all, or someone perhaps with tunnel vision. So they're seeing kind of like a racehorse and nothing on the peripheral. So they would take their cane to make sure that the grass line is there when they're walking down a sidewalk. Really important to have those grass lines. Um, a, a mobility techniques are taught by a mobility instructor. A lot of information comes to this cane feeling the tactile markings on the curb cuts when they're being placed appropriately. And thanks to the city for starting to do that. That's helping a lot, okay? Um, feeling a, a down curb or a stair or perhaps a ditch that's right there or anything that's in the way. So the long white mobility cane. Something that more than likely majority of people would not have seen is this is a white ID cane. It identifies that you have some form of vision so more than likely, um, you'd be able to walk down the sidewalk, get to the grocery store, and inside the grocery store because of the lack of contrast, i.e. COVID painted arrows that we have just gone through, and people who have low vision wouldn't be able to tell where those, where those arrows are going, let alone make them out at all. So they would pull this out, hopefully this white ID cane, it identifies that they have vision loss, and you as a sighted individual and a good kind and human being that we all are, are going to offer assistance. Don't grab anyone. Don't yank them. Just offer your assistance. 
Okay, and there's a third cane, which I don't have, which is called the support cane. Um, and that's generally for people who have enough sight to walk down the sidewalk, but they, they perhaps have a really severe arthritis in their knees or whatever the case may be for stability. All right, do we have, uh, switching between some windows here. Okay. So, okay, yes, question seven. If a person using a guide dog is waiting to cross an intersection with a traffic light, the dog determines when it is safe to cross the street. 52% said false. 52% said false. Yeah. So it's a little more divided, this one. Oh. Right. Well, somebody's been telling all the answers somewhere out there. Very good. Um, so actually, I don't know if you can see him or not. My guide dog, Lewis, is laying very quietly, finally, um, beside me. We work as a team. He is the eyes. I'm supposed to be the brains. The guide dogs are not for everyone. They are a lot of work. It's a living, breathing creature. It's an everyday chore and process and training for the remainder since we've partnered up. And guide dogs are taught to navigate around obstacles that are in a way to stop at down curbs and up curbs and to follow a good um, barrier that is there to get us and navigate those of us who are blind or partially sighted to where we need to be. This is why street design is very crucial that curbs and sidewalks and interior designs are made so that we can we can appropriately tell where the guide dog to go because contrary to most people's belief i can't tell the dog to hey take me to kate's house because he wouldn't know i have to know how to get her myself and i didn't so kate had to meet me thank you again <laughs> um and so i'm the brains and the dog is the eye and when we get to a traffic light he stops and i make the decision listening for my parallel traffic to move in the direction that I need to go forward, and then I give a command to go forward. You will all be getting more information in your email boxes um, at the end of this presentation to explain further because we don't have much time. <laughs> all right, last question. The biggest obstacle faced by persons with sight loss is not the physical lack of sight, but the misconception about sight loss held by sighted people. And 90% said true. Very good. Yeah. Thumbs up to everybody. That, that is absolutely, um, in my 26 years of being uh, blind, uh, that's the term I use for myself. And keep in mind, I'm only one person here talking today, okay? Out of that 40,000 uh, Nova Scotians who are blind and partially sighted, I'm only one person. So the hardest problem is not the barriers. Yes, they're annoying, they're frustrating, they give me anxiety, they put me into depression quite often because can I get to where I need to go without running into another barrier or finding my way the way I need to be going. But it's the, the for some reason, some strange correlation and not just for the blind and partially sighted, but talking to friends and acquaintances of mine with, with um, other disabilities, we have, a, we, we have perhaps, so I'm blind, but my brain still works. And friends of mine who have two master's degrees who are blind have a hard time finding a job because what are we going to do with this person who can't see 100%? Uh, parents who are living with sight loss, uh, two parents I'm aware of, uh, both mom and dad are completely blind, raising four children on their own who are sighted. It's chaotic. I don't have children. I don't think I'd be able to deal just with one, but that's four. And they're constantly being asked all sorts of absurd questions. So it's not just about the blind and partially sighted. It's, it's the strange correlation when it comes across the disability board that able-bodied people think that we're not capable to think for ourselves, let alone do everything else that is possible to be doing. I think everyone out there though is gonna be changing their minds if you wanna be part of my mafia. Okay. Okay, so we're starting with the stairs at the Nova Center. Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna go into uh, some of the pictures and some of the barriers and the stairs at the at the the World the, Trade the Center Convention Center. The, yeah, the Convention Center. Um, what we're seeing on the screen is in the Rogers Square. Yeah. These are fancy designed steps. Do we remember what what eye condition they're under? Oh, it's uh, macular detritus. Okay, so if we know where we are uh, in that Rogers Square, aesthetically pleasing stairs are are great for those who see. They're completely dangerous. This has just been currently made, built, um, and as far as I'm concerned, the, the codes and bylaws were not followed. Under macular degeneration, if you'll notice what is up on your screen, you can barely make out those stairs. Do we have another picture? Um, we have 
the next one would be a diabetic retinopathy, I believe. Yeah. And this is the same set of stairs. They, they, it's almost like a waterfall under diabetic retinopathy. You can, you can see for yourselves what, what a person with diabetic retinopathy may or may not see. Keep in mind that everybody with the eye condition, different eye conditions uh, will have different levels of, of sight. Um, and a third one, I believe. Uh, yep, steps, uh, and this is cataracts. Okay, uh, just the gray steps? Yeah, the gray steps. Okay, so this is a set, set of stairs that are all gray with a, with a gray handrail um, under cataracts. And you will notice as well that it's very hard to distinguish where these stairs are. This is why it's really important um, and you will also be getting an attachment in your emails about at the edge of the stairs to paint bright yellow markings to make sure to ensure that someone with sight loss, no matter what kind of sight loss it is, can identify that as a set of stairs. And I have a little funny story here. I did a presentation <laughs> with a young group of, of, of kids um, in an after school program prior to COVID. And um, the directors had asked me, I had questioned, that they had a, a young child with, with sight loss and this particular child was having a hard time coming up a set of stairs such as the one that you're noticing right now on your screen. So I guess they called someone, I'm not sure who, because they certainly didn't check in with the proper individuals and they were told to paint the stairs yellow. So they painted the stairs yellow, all of the stairs yellow, which means all that this young child was seeing was a big blob of yellow. But what should have happened was the, the stairs should have had a bright yellow strip, something that is contrasting at the end of each edge of the step so that this individual, this young child would have been able to see the, the bright strip, a gray, another bright strip, a gray, which identifies that there's a, a staircase there. Okay, mm -hmm. so make sure you check in with proper authorities before those of you who are engineers out there, designers, developers, you're checking with the proper people, i.e. myself, CNIB, AEBC, and all of those things will be listed as well, CCB, all of those of us who are actually living the life. All right, what do we have next? Uh, it's the good staircase. Okay, and now we have the perfect staircase right in front of CNIB Vision Loss Rehabilitation Nova Scotia on Almond Street. You will notice, and this oh, is under... This whoop. is an interior staircase. Sorry. Oh, it's, Where, an, it's an interior staircase. Is that not the one that you wanted to show for good? For good? We might not have the good one then. Okay, which one was this? <laughs> okay, this is uh, glaucoma. You're looking down a stairwell, and it sort of shows dark around the edges. It's... There's no color contrasting on the steps. Oh, this, this is a bad one too? I don't think it's very good. No. Okay, there's railings on either side, but other than that, it's no, visually not ideal. Okay, so maybe we'll stop. So wait, well, we, we've, got, we've got another set of stairs here for you to look at under glaucoma, yeah. and <laughs> it's missing contrast as well. Forgive us. <laughs> we, we did rehearse this once. Okay, <laughs> do, we, do we have the stairs with the... With the color? I don't think we do. At the CNIB? No. We don't? We don't. All right. Well, wait, I don't know what happened to that. Okay, it, drive by, walk by, bike by, whatever you have to do in front of CNIB on Almond Street, okay? Those stairs are done proper, properly. They, they have um, the bright color. They have tactile marking at the top of each step, as does the actual central library, which, which have done, uh, been made pretty, pretty well as far as stairwells go. So someone with uh, low vision uh, would be able to identify feel underneath their foot that there's uh, something there in the tactile bumps and or with their cane um, that, that they're approaching a set of stairs and so then they will be able to slow down their pace and not topple down because that happens a lot. Okay, sorry about that. No, yeah, that, that, that's my fault. Um, there is a diagonal crossing here. Okay, yeah. let's talk about crossings here. Um, the diagonal crossing, this is a picture should be of Bears Road, Young and Windsor. The biggest sore point in my life right now um, for 13 years, we're hoping this will be amended very shortly, anybody out there with traffic. Uh, and the, the problem with this, it's on a diagonal. Try and imagine crossing that with your white cane, okay? We're taught to walk as straight as possible, follow the parallel um, noise of the traffic. There is no way to cross this Bears and Windsor intersection we have to walk around and the reason I have this here is because after you cross that superstore on Young Street is one of the closest grocery stores for me 
yet I have to divert myself even with the dog in many, many blocks to go around in a safe fashion to get to the grocery store. Why? I don't know. We're gonna ask the city about that, but it's gonna get changed, 13 years, okay? And that intersection also has no automated pedestrian signals to identify when it is for a safe crossing. The next one. Next one. Oh, this is the, the crosswalk that uh, leads to a telephone pole. Okay. So now we have a, <laughs> a crosswalk that leads to the telephone pole. Zebra lines? Yep, zebra lines. Great. So if you can't see 100%, you'll be following the zebra lines. Step up on the curb right into a telephone pole. Anybody see a problem there? I think we do. Okay. And then? Okay. Uh, the bright white lines of the crossing. Okay. Here's a, here's a, a very good crosswalk, bright white lines, um, enough to identify for people who are using white canes and have low vision, or maybe someone who actually walks, um, has low vision, but doesn't use a long white cane. They just might pull out their white ID cane. So that is very good contrast. It's a straight on crossing. Um, and I'm not sure if that picture actually is an intersection with the, with the, uh, with the light or an automated pedestrian signal or not, but that is a proper appropriate crosswalk, which we need to have everywhere. Okay, okay. Uh, th this is along Young Street, I believe. It's one of the driveways, like a sidewalk of the driveway. Okay, so this is what we have now is a picture of the driveway along Young Street and Young Street going into the superstore. In the small town of Alberta, where I grew up, at, they in a large parking lot and this is another giant barrier not just to those who are blind or partially sighted but to each and every single pedestrian shopper so in a small town if a small town can do this in alberta there is no reason that we cannot do this in a progressive city like halifax or the province of nova scotia this sidewalk this parking lot to get into the young street superstore has no slope to identify when there, the big driveway is to get into so constantly I'm bypassing it, even though I'm trying to tell the dog to make a left. You can't hear the traffic coming out of that Young Street parking lot because of the loud noise that is actually on Young Street with the other traffic. So we're constantly risking our lives. What needs to happen there is to have a small grade put in. One that is not too difficult for someone with a wheelchair user to be using, but one that is that one has enough of a slope, enough of a grade for someone with the white cane or a guide dog to be able to stop and pause at to identify that they're going to be crossing a dangerous parking lot. And then if they are going to go into the parking lot, we need sidewalks. No matter what is happening here, a lot of buildings that are being built to this day, when you're coming off a bus, let's say you're a bus user, you get onto a main sidewalk and you have to get, get across to, let's say, the Walmart or shoppers on uh, Almond Street. Um, there is no safe sidewalk. You're walking through a parking lot with cars moving, which is very dangerous for those who cannot see, which is very dangerous for parents with strollers, which is very dangerous for all pedestrians involved. So we need to start to make a big change and big headways. And I will pick on the superstore because there's pretty much not a single superstore, unlike Sobeys, I don't have any investments with them either, people, so don't misunderstand that. Majority of the superstores do not have any safe sidewalks from a main sidewalk off the street to get into them safely. Next. Yes. All right, so as we were talking, I switched to the superstore picture with okay. the uh, diabetic or not okay. over top of it. Okay, so the picture that Kate uh, put up was, uh, was the superstore uh, parking lot with diabetic retinopathy, and again, you would have been able to see how difficult it is to cross. You know, and this being all said, even those who are fully sighted, we live in a very foggy city. So just at that point, even if your eyes are working 100%, um, and it's dark around here, I'm told constantly. So this is important as safety issues uh, for everyone, not just me on the other end of the screen. Okay, next picture. Next picture, the waterfront on the boardwalk. My favorite place to be. Here's a picture of the waterfront. Um, Anybody think quickly in their head what the problem with this is? Anybody? No, you can't answer me, so it doesn't matter. So <laughs> I'll tell you, I've never been able to walk down there by myself. Those who are kind of like kamikazes with their white canes, I know of a few people, they will go down there and, and they, will, they will use it because they have a little bit of sight. 
There is no safe barriers on the water side. There is no tactile marking for me to identify where I am or where I'm going. And if the waterfront is actually quite busy, it is very difficult for a guide dog to travel to follow anything such as a border that would be closer to the water side in a straight fashion. So the you engineers out there, all the young people and, and the waterfront commission, we need to think of how to make some sort of a tactile marking so that I can actually be a big girl and pull up my, my pants and walk down there by myself and not have to go with friends, which I'm always having a nice time with. But we really, really need to consider about making uh, more tactile so that it's accessible and equitable to everyone, not just to pedestrians who are using their feet or are able to, mm -hmm. okay? Yep, and this is a map at the waterfront. Now, Kate took a picture of a map on the waterfront. Um, great, lovely, we all see it. Useless to me, no idea, okay? Um, just like maps that are shown in buildings for emergency exit, useless to me. No tactile, no braille. Um, and again, going back to the equity here and the safety uh, on the interior. So we need to start to consider this as well. Keeping in mind that everybody reads braille. Um, so tactile markings are really important as well, okay? And signs attached to a pole. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one picture of a sign attached to a pole. I, <laughs> since COVID and the construction people have been uh, free to run amok, um, but thank you to construction mitigation. Thank you to construction mitigation and the certain people that I've been talking to. This sign here is too low. Somebody who's blind or partially sighted will be walking and more than likely smack their, their forehead into and cut their forehead open, okay? These signs need to be moved up. Since COVID has started and construction signs have been, have been put up, they have been lowered down again to head level. I'm five feet tall, that's all. Imagine someone who's taller than me, who can't see 100%, that they would be cutting their foreheads open and it has happened numerous times. So signs need to be above six feet for the most part, for any kind of signage, um, so that people who are blind and partially sighted and not interfering on a sidewalk whatsoever. I will say, again, thank you to construction mitigation and, and development management uh, over there, if anybody signed in, that we've done a very good job on getting the construction people themselves actually under control a little bit. Not far enough, but we're getting there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is with the guy wire. Here's me in the guy wire on Young Street. Now, <laughs> anybody from, from right away, if you're signed on, don't freak out because I want to give a really positive. Unfortunately, this guy wire here, had I not been with the sighted friend, one of my mafia picture friends, um, I would have hit that guy wire. I'm five feet tall, let's not forget that. Anybody else taller would have probably strangled themselves or cut their neck open, okay? This guy wire should not have been placed the way it was. Um, it ended up being that the attention was gotten because of some of, some of my friends who helped me to circulate this um, and into the paper for the examiner. You can find that article. The good thing about it, and I will say this name, thank you, Mr. Christopher Davis, that the sky wire has been fixed. It is an HRM situation. It is a utility situation. And this picture is being circulated in the departments now to do training. Since that day, which was, I believe, about two months ago, um, because of this picture of myself, and believe you me, I don't like being on camera here. It makes me feel really weird. I'd rather just be the voice. Since this picture, there have been a lot of guy wires that have been noticed, and they're going to get fixed. So I'm going to ask each of you out there again, bring your cameras, take the pictures, send them to 311. And the reason I ask you is because a lot of my sighted friends who were walking down Young Street with Guy Wire had told me that they were compensating to move themselves out of the way because this is what we do as human beings. And because they forget that I'm blind, which is great because then they're on that always focused on the fact that I'm blind. But at the same point, you people who can see 100%, we're compensating constantly for what we're seeing, we'll move out of the way. But those of us who cannot see, cannot do that. So kudos to the right of way department. We're fixing things. We're moving along. It's not all ugly here, people, I promise. <laughs> um, oh, uh, th this is the headline about the tactile bus stop indicator. 
Okay, so we have a, a, a link here. I'm going to switch to buses here for a second. Um, we're jumping all over the place because, like as I said, I had a lot to, to say. So uh, a thank you, Halifax Transit, for putting bus announcements um, on, even though they've been in London, England for decades, along in parts of the States and Ontario, but we finally have them. So now I know that there's a closer bus stop for me to get off to my closest liquor store instead of having to walk 50 blocks out of the way. So <laughs> that being said, we still have a long way to go with Halifax Transit. One being, uh, and this is uh, the city as well, uh, buses, let's take Beaverbank, for example, Herring Cove Road, where a lot of the times we, those of us who cannot see, or perhaps you're a person who uses a wheelchair, rather than getting off at the stop, that would be closest to us. We have to go all the way around the route because there's no sidewalk on on the on the edge. Like Beaverbank only has sidewalk running up on on one side of the road. So we take this bus all the way around, which takes another twenty to thirty minutes. Why are we stuck this way? I don't know. We haven't figured that out yet because we're going to fix it. Um, so we need to put the sidewalks and we need to find markers on how to identify where a bus stop is. If you drop me off in the middle of Dartmouth. I wouldn't be able to tell you where the next bus stop was to be able to find my way home. And in order to do that, this article here uh, coming out of Vancouver, I believe. It's Vancouver, yeah. Okay, out of Vancouver. Their transit system is willing to put a heck of a lot of money in to put tactile markings to identify every bus stop on the sidewalk. Unfortunately, the city itself, that would be HRM, is not willing to participate yet, but we're gonna move forward. So let's get ahead of the game, people that are listening because I believe that Halifax and Nova Scotia can be world-class, not just Canada-class. And if we get ahead of the game and we do this and we make everything equitable for everybody, we'll be that much better. And we'll have a lot more movie stars coming here. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, uh, the directory in a lobby of an apartment, touch screen. Okay, so this, so this is a directory. Um, in the lobby, uh, I'm not sure where this where this picture is, and it's basically an intercom system. Uh, it, there was one apparently in the Lululemon building. I'm being told um, these are popping up everywhere. The problem, and apparently there is a solution. So bear with me, everybody here, is that these intercom systems have no tactile on them. They're touchscreen. They don't talk with the exception that now we're only finding out. And this is something else that's very, very wrong with, with construction, with interior designs. There's not enough communication going between departments and, and people who you are building for, for safety and for equity. So I'm only finding out recently myself that apparently there is a button on these intercom systems, very small, that you push and it would talk to you in a very loud voice to bring lots of attention, because I need more attention, which doesn't seem right to me, to, so you could access to where you're going and somebody could buzz you in. Nobody's consulted with any of us that I'm aware of, that us being the blind and partially sighted. And rather than having the old telephone push button to let somebody in, this is what's happening now. Um, do we have another picture? Um, I, I have the, yes, the, I forgot the name, Maritime Center. Okay, Maritime Center. And if, if the person is online that I'm going to have a conversation with, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to give a very big uh, kudos up. So in the Maritime Center, what has happened in there apparently, and I'm going to get more information again, this has just been brought to my attention, the pictures that are being shown, all the braille buttons in the elevator have been removed. Um, the only buttons left inside the elevator are the emergency and, and the open door and closed door. What has happened in the Maritime Center now is it's these iPad sort of screens, touch them, and they're on each floor. So therefore, to my understanding, and Kate had a researcher go down and check it out actually, you as a sighted person will go up and you will, will uh, use your finger to touch screen where, what floor you wanna go. I don't know, sounds kind of strange to me, uh, the person on the other end, um, that if you've made a mistake and you wanted floor four, yet you've punched in floor three, you get on the elevator, there's nothing for you to do. So you're gonna have to get off of this elevator, back out into, into the lobby on that floor and, and tap the floor that you want. Now on this one, there is a wheelchair 
tactile button and braille. Keep in mind, I don't read braille. The tactile button, again, you're gonna push it and it will ask you what floor it will actually speak for those of us who cannot see in a very, very loud voice. So I'm willing to listen to what is happening here to understand because communication is lacking on all ends to find out why this has been implemented and why they're going across our city into a lot of new buildings. It could be a good thing, maybe. I just haven't figured it out yet because I don't know everything. On the 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 touchscreen things, I, I wanna I wanna give a shout out to uh, Restaurant Association of Nova Scotia as well because something else. So a lot of debit machines in a lot of our uh, craft stores and restaurants and pubs have the touch screens, no voice, nothing. And more often than not, I've had to give my pin to the server in order to pay for my bill. There is a big solution to that. And Ryan O'Reilly of Sona is gonna take this forward. All of these debit machines, and this is what I need all of you guys to be doing as well, to make sure when you're out there at a pub and a restaurant supporting all these local shops that desperately need us right now, ask if there's actual a silicone tactile cover. Each of these machines, debit machines, are to come with a tactile silicone cover or shield. And therefore, I, as a person who's blind, can actually put in my own pin because now I will have that braille uh, screen on the top. Not a lot of servers are willing to go and look for them. And my decision on that part is I'm going to sit there and not pay until they find it. And if your restaurant or pub doesn't have this, then, and if you have a debit machine that is a touch screen without the tactile cover, then you need to switch your providers. Go to Sona, I'll help them, okay? <laughs> because they're providing this. So that's something else that's been a challenge as well that we're working on. And it's hard work, people. So I need you out there to help me along, okay? Can we all nod? I hope we're nodding. Okay, what's next? Uh, this is the interior of, I think it's Zatzman with the, with the good bench placement under the stairs. Okay. Interior of the Zatzman Sports Center. Um, this is a floating staircase. And apparently in the World Trade Center, here we go again with this brand new building. Um, there's a floating staircase. And what, what that means is that if I'm walking from behind it with my cane, I will be walking straight underneath those stairs and cutting my forehead open. Not interested. But the Zatzman's very easy solution right here, as, as Kate has in the picture, um, it has how many chairs? Uh, it's kind of a continuous bench system, actually. Okay, a continuous bench system. So there's no way for me to hit my head on the stairs that are floating, because I'm going to hit that bench first, which is not going to hurt. So we need to think about what we're doing in, in that fashion as well. Um, and take a look again in a lot of the, the buildings that have this situation and no barriers. Um, to protect those of us who cannot see. And there's a lot of us, 40,000, <laughs> okay? Okay, so this is uh, cataracts and it's the blurry image of, do you want me to give it away what it is? Yes. Okay, <laughs> the blurry image of the bathroom. Oh, okay. <laughs> now what you're looking at is, is um, it's a blurry image. And what this image is, is of a bathroom, okay? Um, you will notice that there are, there's some black dots there and this is looking through the lens of a cataract? Yeah. Okay, cataracts. If you weren't familiar with the bathroom, if you're blind or partially sighted, those black contrasting dots there, it's actually the paper towel holder and um, the soap dispenser, dispenser. So contrast in bathroom situations, highly important. Contrast in any situation. The Stanfield International Airport in the bathroom is all white, pure white. If your sight is not good, you're gonna walk in there into an island of white, okay? And easy solution, get black paper towel holders, get black uh, sinks so that, that somebody who has enough vision is able to see that contrast to identify where things are. Um, on that same point too, Buildings that are built, being built right now and, and uh, staying on the contrasting line, glass buildings. It's like birds flying into a, into a glass window. I think we've rectified the situation for the birds, but we haven't rectified the situation for people who are blind or partially sighted. If you have a building with a full glass front, the door handles, the door frames must have good contrast. You're either going to go with the 
dark black or a bright yellow or whatever the, whatever the case may be. So we can identify where the door is, let alone find the door and not walk into the glass itself. I hope I'm making sense here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And oh, that's it. Excellent. That's perfect timing. All right. So <laughs> those are all the pictures. I know I filled your heads with a, with a lot of information. Um, how much time do we have for questions? We have 15 minutes. We got wow, 15 minutes. Very good. I didn't even get to cover everything and I'm not going to um, the issues with COVID and everything else, but we will open up um, to questions. Yes. Questions. Um, and I can explain things further um, as we go along because we wanted to get all of this in. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Okay. So we are opening up to questions. Uh, what I kind of did last week, which I thought worked really well, is, is uh, if you could write in the chat if you have a question you want to ask, and then I can call on people uh, that way. Um, just so everyone's not, you know, turning their microphones all on at once. So if there's any questions, please, you know, indicate. And while you're writing your questions, can I hear me? Yep. Oh, while you're writing your questions, I, I do want to say that a lot of the things that I've mentioned here are already written into our, our uh, bylaws and codes of buildings. Um, the biggest problem, which seems to be running across HRM right now is one, the lack of communication, two, the lack of enforcement, um, and three, I'll go back again with the lack of communication. Everything I've spoken about today is written into the building codes accessible, the case being when people think accessible, so we'll go back to a Walmart. Um, Walmart thinks it's accessible because it has a ramp to get someone who uses a wheelchair in. But if you're coming off a bus and you're going across this giant parking lot, someone who's blind, partially sighted, or a wheelchair user, or anyone is putting themselves at danger, at high risk, to get to that accessible ramp to get into the front door. It's all written in, and people are taking developers builders are taking into what they want but in the codes it's all there to make sure and to reinforce um that all this is being accomplished and we're lacking in that part right now in hrm all right okay i do see a couple questions in the chat which i have opened now um i suppose uh elisa's question is first does elise want to ask her question in person or would she rather i read it hi i'll say it. Excellent. Hi, and thanks for all that. Um, I'm in Liverpool and our one traffic light now has an audible signal because the Sobeys actually has somebody with I think like 5% vision. He has a cane and I saw him with a CNIB um, helper learning how to navigate the intersection. But the problem like your picture with the diagonal crosswalk and, and the way the ramp is with the sidewalk, the curb ramp angles you to the middle of the intersection and he can't find, even with the audible signal trying to direct him, he, he can't find his way. So, you know, we're not gonna move the roads, which is what would have to happen. What do you think about the directional tactile instead of the truncated domes, you know, the, the directional ones? How would that, would that work? Would that be helpful? I've, I've been, <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, I, I've been, I've been with the powers that be trying to, to beg for this um, stuff. The only example I could think of um, is, and I know, and I know in Montreal, you, you know, the cobblestone. So if you put cobblestone, let's say cobblestone, it doesn't have to be, but some sort of a tactile, if it's a diagonal crossing on where the white lines are painted, not the entire crosswalk because that's that's not safe and not good for someone who's using a wheelchair let alone strollers but if you had on the white lines tactile markings so that you could follow with your white cane as your cane is on the ground then that would help a lot and the excuse that I get here in HRM is snow plows would remove it well if you found the proper way to put these in snow plows would not remove it they don't remove it in Montreal they don't remove it in any other parts of the world it, they would not remove it and if they do, we spend a little bit more money to, to fix it um, so that the safety and the life of a person who's blind or partially sighted remains. Does that help? Yes. So like even a line of brick or some kind of guiding, guiding uh, tactile something. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and you, you know, you, it, you, if you call it Johanna Stork, 
with the CNIB uh, Vision Loss Rehabilitation. She's a mobility instructor um, and she would be able to give you a lot more information that, uh, with that. And, and I'll be sending out an attachment with a lot of these things as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Elise. Uh, I see a question from Siobhan that uh, I'm going to read. Okay. Um, so what considerations would you recommend for large directional maps similar to the example of the waterfront map? Tactile in braille, raised building outlines and or raised pathway outlines, et cetera. All of it. <laughs> <laughs> All of it. Um, definitely tactile, um, um, some braille, um, you know, and, and we can work on that. It, it's, it's, it's a, a work in progress that, that we need to start going forward. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm only one person here, so we'd have to survey you know, quite a few individuals, which shouldn't be that difficult to do, what would work the best for everyone involved. Contrast, tactile, um, paths, probably the most, excuse me, the most important, um, you know, which way you're going or, or maybe even the shop. So it's, it's a lot to consider. We put that in there because as an example, because there's a lot of these maps around the city that uh, don't make any sense, <laughs> i.e. who I'm a board member of, chair of events for the Friends of the Public Gardens. Nothing to help us to walk around there. <laughs> and don't be mad at me for anybody who's on the board right now listening. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions just yet. Maybe. No. I should have had things to talk about. We've talked so much one-on-one -on -one that you've answered my questions. So I need to think back to the ones <laughs> I've asked in the past, maybe. Um, oh, I see another question from Elise, actually. So yeah, please go ahead. Hi again. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I was looking at interpretation panels in the public areas like parks. Uh, again, in Liverpool, let's say there's a lighthouse at the Fort Point Park, and there's a nice description about the old ways of boat building and all that. And I was wondering, what about like just putting a QR code that could link you, you know, with your phone, if you had some kind of tactile thing to indicate, okay, here's a QR code, you put your phone on it, and you could link to a site that might have an audio or something, it just felt like an easy intervention. Definitely. Um, yes. And, and, um, and um, my brother who lives in London, England, actually, when I visited, visited him. Now, if, if you do have such a, you know, device, an iPhone, um, or even, or even just pushing, pushing a, a button of, of some sort of recording on that interpretive map, uh, those things would go a long way to help. And that would be, well, you know, a quick, I wouldn't say probably easy solution because you have to find the proper um, technology, but we're moving in that direction and something like that would be absolutely wonderful and, and greatly appreciated. Well, I'll tell you, I, I kind of tested it out. I have an old phone. I think it's like I six or something, Yeah. but you can now go to a website for free, easy, no membership or anything. It's generating QR codes and you give it the website you want it to go to. And that website can just be an audio file. So I very easily created a QR code and was able to read it with my phone and have it read to me. Like it was actually easier than I thought. So I'm hoping that we can maybe test it out here and spread that along. Definitely. It also and means if, that if it it's be working, well. then, then um, you know, do, do uh do check in and, and um, I don't know, get through Peach, through, just send it all this way so, so we all know. Yeah, I've seen it used on menus too. So it yeah. means it's easily changeable. If you can edit your website, your QR code is the same. Um, and yeah, you just have your camera on the phone and even the kind of lower tech phones can do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Um, the next question is from Jada. Did Jada want to ask the question uh, his or herself? Or... <clears throat> yeah, I can ask the question. Okay. Um, so I essentially just said, um, what steps can we take as planning students um, to increase awareness of the issues that you've mentioned um, in your presentation, as well as like taking steps towards 
um, implementing solutions? Whew. Heavy loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what steps? What steps you can you can is, is again you know all joking aside. I, I I do ask you know we're all walking around with iPhones and and things like that. Snap the pictures. Um, if you notice that something on the street or in the building would be problematic to somebody who's blind or partially sighted, um, particularly more on on the street sides on the out on the exterior, send it to three one one. They are a great resource um, and they will put you in the proper in the proper to the proper departments that you can have these discussions with. I I kind of answer your question and kind of not um, I've dropped a lot of advocacy ex with the exception of this because like most people with disabilities I deal with depression and for me the reason I have a guide dog is so that I can walk a lot faster um, <laughs> not always the case and get out but the barriers have been overwhelmingly so since all construction and even in some buildings. Um, for example, Quinpool, this is gonna sound bad, Quinpool liquor store in Canadian Tire off of Quinpool, the doors are locked. So we have to find our way to walk around to the back, which has no sidewalk and is dangerous to get in. I've asked the management, why? They're saying it's COVID, doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm not dropping this and working with, with students like yourself, you're the one who's listened to me. Hopefully you're going to be a little bit more aware. Um, and just by asking your question and what you're doing here, um, and when you get out into the field to be working, even if you're not in, in, in an engineering, developing, whatever department, you can make other people aware. That's, that's what you're going to do. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, there's a few people in the chat uh, sharing their support for Milena, the Milena Mafia. So. Yahoo! <laughs> no, no, no membership cost either. <laughs> um, and there's a question, I hope I'm going in order here, from Natasha, and she would, wants me to read it. So, um, how does winter ma maintenance affect accessibility and what solutions do you recommend in Halifax? Um, you know, snow is obviously a big... Yeah, very good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> winter, winter maintenance. You know, I, I have friends who are, are white cane users and um, and the fact that they travel on icy, icy sidewalks and uh, five inches of snow make my jaw drop. I, my, my guide dog it helps me a lot. Uh, there's no way I'd be able to be with a white cane uh, traversing in the snow piles that we have. Winter maintenance, this is all up to us, every single one of us to keep pushing city councillors, the HRM, because it comes down to, if there are any councillors listening here, it comes down to the councillors to make sure that the departments, the builders, um, the snow removers are doing what they've been hired to do properly. Um, you know, as it stands right now, and I know the excuse is always, no matter what it is in the winter season, no matter for what development, finance, finance, finance. But the truth of the matter is, if you're not out there and doing what needs to be done immediately, you're going to spend much more money and waste the taxpayer's money. So let's get it right. Let's do it right the first time and snow plows get out there as soon as possible. Find that money. Nova Scotia is rich. They claim not to be, but I know there's hidden money. And so it's up to our brand new city councillors that are out there um, to lobby them, to have them to put the pressure for snow removal that's going to be done as it should be, and not to hire contractors who just drop the ball and don't do their job. And I won't mention certain companies who remove the snow, but they should not even get any contract. It should not go to the cheapest bidder. That's my answer for that. <laughs> uh, so we're just, we're one minute to one thirty. Okay. So I'm just going to say, cause I see some people are heading out uh, that, you know, thank you so much for coming everybody. Um, and we hope to see you back in a couple of weeks for Anne's presentation on November 18th. So please keep, you know, monitoring emails and uh, our website at peachresearch.ca. Um, and I'm just seeing if there's any final questions we can wrap okay. up. Uh...
And I'll, and I'll say thank you again to, to my Kate here, whom I would not have been able to have done this, and to Makiko, and for giving me the, the <laughs> opportunity to do this, and for all of you for listening. So <laughs> thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> and yeah, that's, uh, oh, Bill makes some good comments in the chat, adding to the Milena Mafia. Um, just saying to something to observe and confirm the pathways between the streets and buildings, uh, like seen in, you know, um, the superstore parking lots and things that you were talking about. Yeah. So something to, to also observe. And I think that's an important message. Thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, it's 1.30, so I guess we should probably wrap up. Wrap up. Wrap up. All right, so thanks so much for being here. <laughs> thank you and for having me. <laughs> thank you to everyone. As Melina said in the beginning, uh, you know, feel welcome to send us emails so that we can connect Melina to, to you as well and answer any questions that we didn't get to today. And all right, so thanks very much, everyone, for a successful third lecture. <laughs> thanks, Melina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.